Good to have you here as we gather and worship this day. Just a couple of reminders. Um, if you have a prayer request that you would like to share, lift up during, uh, lift it up during the service. There are green prayer cards on uh, the back of the chair in front of you, um, and we invite you to fill one of those out, and they'll be collected following the sermon. And also, there are uh, some uh, membership pads at the end of the row. Uh, we invite you to attend this path that we invite you to pass us down and, and sign in and uh, if there's information you'd like us to know you can put it on that and that'll get to the office um, it is a beautiful day it is the day that God has made so as we come together and worship let us rejoice and give thanks in God's love and God's abounding grace in our lives by the choir too. Thank you. 
Your words of life are cast upon the earth with a generous hand and a hopeful heart. All around us are signs of growth in our earth, in our families, in our nation, in our world. We come this day seeking your healing love and abounding mercy. Open our hearts to receive the gifts you sow so graciously and freely that we may become fruitful workers for you. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his Spirit that dwells in you. lesson is from Matthew chapter 13 verses 1 through 9 and 18 to 23. 
That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some feeds fell, seeds fell on a path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, but they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. If you have ears, hear. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root that endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of this age and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and another thirty. Please join me in the response. May the Spirit fill us with wisdom and understanding as we ponder the meaning of the these words for our lives. In his book, The Parables of the Kingdom, C.H. Dodd wrote that a parable leaves the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise application to tease the mind into active thought. The parable leaves the mind in sufficient doubt to tease it into active thought. We're getting ready to move into a series of weeks where we'll be looking at some parables that Jesus used, so I thought that was a good quote to start to start that out. Jesus often taught in parables, and by doing so, he often confused his listeners. Uh, but in doing that, he also invited us into active thought rather than into just simple answers. And maybe a case in point is the one you heard today, the parable of the sawyer. It <laughs> is it self-evident. I mean, otherwise, why would Jesus have to conclude by saying, let anyone with ears listen? The parable of the sower presents what, in agricultural terms, seems like an easy enough concept to understand that not all the seeds that are sown produce the same results. On the farm, sometimes the reason for that is because the seed was bad. But the problem that the parable points out is not the seed, but where the seed lands. The seed falls upon the ground and gets mixed result depending on the type of soil. Some seed falls on the path, some seed gets eaten by the birds. Some seed falls on rocky ground where there's not enough nutrients to sustain it. Some seed falls among the thorns and weeds and it's choked out. But some seed falls on good soil, and that seed produces grain. Now Matthew, after Jesus tells the parable, there's an interpretation that most uh, believe probably came from Matthew rather than Jesus, an interpretation of the parable. The interpretation is that God's message falls upon the ears of, of all persons with different results, that some folks, having been hardened by life, like a beaten path, have no place for the seeds of, of God's kingdom to get old and take root. Or other people have maybe shallow lives, and while the kingdom of God may get a good hearing and even some commitment, other priorities soon take over and the growth of the kingdom wanes. And still other people have things besides the kingdom already sprouting in their lives. And those other things effectively choke out any seeds of the kingdom that try to take root. But some people are like fertile soil, and the seeds of God's kingdom take root 
and bear fruit in their lives. In this interpretation, the emphasis of the parable is placed on the soil and the quality of the soil. Are you good soil? Or are you rocky soil? Are you soil overrun with thorns and weeds? This interpretation puts the emphasis of the parable upon us. We need to strive to be good soil and remove those things from our lives that prevent us from producing the harvest that we should. Now that's a good and important message for us, and we should take it to heart. But it's not the only message here. It's, it's not, Jesus told parables not primarily to teach us what we are to do, even though there's a piece of that there. But Jesus told parables primarily to teach us something about God. In the original parable, the emphasis is on the sower. The sower. So this morning I want to look at the parable from the angle of the sower. Think back to how the parable starts. The sower is just throwing seeds everywhere. Think about all the indiscriminate sowing that's going on. Would a careful farmer deliberately sow seeds in a pathway among weeds or even on rocky ground? There's just a lot of good seed that's being wasted here. It's surely an extravagant farmer. But the failure of the seed is in total. By the end of the parable, despite the sad end of most of the seed, some of the seed does germinate and produces a harvest. Now we've often kind of been told that, to believe that the, that the yield was spectacular. When it fell on the good soil, it produced a magnificent harvest, a 30, 60, even 100 fold. But Brandon Scott argues that what those numbers represent on the scale of great harvest at the time of Jesus is an average to good harvest. The harvest is not in any way miraculous or extraordinary, but the typical harvest. Think of it. Some of the seed fell on good soil, and it produced an average yield. It takes a lot of pressure off, doesn't it? That's it. The, the miracle of Jesus' illustration is that some of the seed produced grain, and it was an average yield, and that's to be celebrated. But a lot of the seeds just being scattered everywhere, and it falls um, where it's unable to produce seed. But that doesn't deter the sower. The sower continues flinging seeds of love and grace everywhere, on the path, on rocky ground, among the thorns, and some of it lands on good soil. You notice that the farmer didn't go out and test the soil first to see if it was good soil for growing grains. He didn't check for rocks or thorns or burn at the stations. He just started flinging seeds everywhere. A good farmer, you'd think, would know better than to throw seeds along paths or thorns. It seems like this is a wasteful farmer, isn't it? That Jesus tells us, would anyone let anyone with ears listen? You might remember that one of the charges that Jesus' opponents were leveling against him was that he was spending too much time among the wrong people. I think it was last week, the scripture we had, or maybe two weeks ago. Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, was one of the charges that people were making against Jesus. Surely a more conscientious person would be a little more discriminating in who they're caught socializing with, the soil that they are uh, throwing seeds around in. Do you get what I'm saying here, says, says Jesus? Jesus came among us to show us what God's love is like. Parables do that. Jesus, like the sower, God, like the sower, so as we seeds of love and acceptance and grace everywhere and on everyone. Some of the seeds falls on rocky or thorny ground, but some seeds sprout and bring forth the harvest. Now, I said before that in Matthew's interpretation of the parable, we're challenged to reflect on what type of soil that we might be in to work to be good soil. But 
the sower doesn't really care what kind of soil it is when the sower just starts flinging seeds everywhere. We often want to limit God's grace. We examine the soil, we examine other people's lives and determine if they're worthy or good soil before we expend much effort there. I mean, why, why would we give help to people if they'll just waste it? Um, we think that God should operate that way too. That this sower just keeps flinging seeds everywhere. We might say that that's pretty wasteful. That that's how God is. Maybe Jesus told this parable because he had been living this parable. You know, Jesus spent a lot of time among a lot of different kinds of people. He spent a lot of time seeing so, sowing seeds in places where they took root and grew, but also in places where it seemed, at least, that maybe the seed was wasted. But here's the twist to all of this. That the people that one would think would be the good soil, you know, the, the respectable people, the well-placed folks, the good, good religious folk, the, the pious folk, the folks who knew the teachings of Scripture best, they were often the ones that rejected what Jesus had to say, who left when his words got too challenging, who felt the most threatened by his message of inclusion and grace. His words couldn't take root among them. Meanwhile, those folks that everyone just knew to be undesirable soil, the poor, the sick, the ones who hadn't seen the innocent inside of a synagogue in years, the tax collectors and the sinners, the drunks and the gluttons, they were the ones who kept coming back time after time, and they were the ones in which the seeds took root and grew and bore fruit. The seed took root and grew, but it wasn't among those who people thought were the good soil. In fact, maybe the parable teaches us that no one could really tell. We can't really tell who's good soil who's thorny soil. But that doesn't matter because the sower doesn't care. The sower just continues to sow seeds everywhere. I spent a lot of time this week getting the summer quarterly out, so, so, um, so this is a rough transition point of the sermon, <laughs> where I transition over to what Paul is talking I think this is a little part of what Paul was trying to get to in his letter to the Romans. Addressing folks who are a lot like us. Paul describes how often we get all confused about God's will and, and then we end up being able to unfill it, un unfulfill it, un unable to fulfill it, there we go. We end up being unable to fulfill it. Then we fall short and we feel guilty. And so God does for us what we're unable to do for ourselves. God justifies us, says Paul. God, God makes us right with God. God wipes the books clean. God, God does all that for us. We don't have to keep striving to win God's approval. We just have to accept and receive God's grace. We can stop worrying and striving and trying to win God's love and acceptance. Because Paul says, we've already got it. Paul says that that's the message that Jesus came to proclaim. There is now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not now, not in the future. David Lopes writes that according to Paul, that's why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to suffer in our place. He didn't come to show us how to live so that we might merit God's love. He didn't come to satisfy some weird sense of justice that makes it possible for God to love us only if blood is shed. And definitely, because blood is definitely not to have the crack cake out of him for sin so that we can feel eternally and simultaneously guilty and grateful. No, says Lowe's, Jesus came to show us through his cross just how much God already loves us. 
and to show us through his resurrection that his love is more powerful than anything, even death, our sin, our confusion, or our sense of being condemned. There is no condemnation, says Paul. Do you remember how the Gospel of John puts it? For God so loved the world that God gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. We have to stop there, but if you go on, John says, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God does not seek to condemn, but the hope, how we struggle with that. In fact, most religion has been so good at telling us how wicked and depraved we humans are and how we better get things cleaned up with God before it's too late. And so even though we hear these words of grace and love, there's still that nagging little piece of regret for a past wrong that we did to another or our inability to let go of some wrong that's done to us that continues to eat away at us. Some maybe suppressed feeling of inadequacy that leaves us feeling unworthy of God's love. That leaves us feeling like we are that inadequate soil that the parable talked about. But the sower isn't worried about the condition of the soil. The sower just seeds, flings of seeds, flings seeds of love and grace and acceptance and meaning and purpose everywhere. You hear what I'm trying to say, said Jesus? No matter what the soil, no matter what we've done or what's been done to us, no matter what we may have been told or believed, Paul says that God is not angry with us. There's no condemnation. To God, we are all good soil. God loves us, forgives us, accepts us as we are, and sets us free to live lives of meaning, and purpose, and grace, and gratitude. So I have a little, uh, I have a little assignment for you today. Um, I want you to imagine, because I did need these cutouts, I want you to imagine that you have a little slip of paper, and, and there, these words are on that slip of paper. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I'd like to invite you, this is an invitation, uh, not a command, but an invitation. I invite you, if you feel so moved, to imaginarily, imaginarily write down on that piece of paper that one regret or misdeed or misfortune that just you know, constantly wears on you. It's all constantly nagging you, raising its ugly head at the most unfortunate and inappropriate times that one part of your life that it forever feels like it's condemning you. So take a minute, write it down on your piece of paper. Okay, now if you all have it, I want you to wad it up. There's a big garbage can here, so just throw it in the garbage and say these words. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Let anyone with ears listen. Mary Oliver's poem, The Summer Day, contains this line. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Isn't that a marvelous question? So I ask you, what will you do with your wild and precious life now that there is no condemnation? What will you do now that you know you're free? What will you do with all the love and the grace that God gives to you? What will you do? How might the seeds that God is sowing in your life now take root and grow? God loves you, forgives you, God accepts you as you are. So may you accept the freedom that God grants to you this day to live a life of meaning and purpose.
purpose, a life filled with grace and gratitude. I invite you to stand as you sing Amazing Grace. <clears throat> surgery on Thursday, and they thank you for your prayers, uh, they, they greatly appreciate it, and um, let us keep Angela in our prayers, she lives in surgery. Lord, hear our prayers. prayers. Uh, we see this online from Kathy Hammers, we greatly appreciate your continued prayers for us. They're talking about transitioning Lou to long-term care. Her lower back is improving, but she still has a ways to go to be pain-free. So for Lou and Kathy, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, this one says, safe journeys for those who are traveling. 
Lord. Prayers. Um, from John, uh, prayers for Mike Fletcher's father. Uh, Mike Fletcher's father passed away. Uh, Mike Fletcher is this Camp Statue director. So be with the family at this time. Lord, hear our prayers. This one, the cave is improving and she's now going to physical therapy. She's still not allowed to drive, but um, we keep her in our prayers. Brigade, Lord, hear our prayers. But I have a, a couple from Kinley here. I'll read those together. Uh, he'd like to pray for him and his mom. Uh, they lost their Chihuahua dog, Odie, uh, on June 30th. So we keep them in prayers with that member of their family. Uh, Kinley also like to pray for his nephew, Landon, who comes home tomorrow and prays that Landon makes better choices after he comes home. And then he also, also from Kinley, uh, like to pray that he, his mom, and his aunt Carrie have a good time swimming and barbecuing at Carrie's house. So we lift up these prayers and uh, say, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, prayers for Ruthie Carter. I received this message too late to share last Sunday. She had uh, got into the hospital, uh, had weakness, couldn't get up out of her chair. So went to the hospital for a day or two, and then she had been at rehab at the terraces. Um, and I know she'd appreciate visitors. And from Shelley, it says, praise and thanks that she is much stronger and will go home soon. For Ruthie, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, Kathy asked for prayers for, for Lynn Reardon and family for the loss of her husband, Joe. And she says they made the beautiful wooden crosses in our sanctuary. So for the weird family, Lord, hear our prayers. Um, from Lauren Esser, prayers for Shirley Chetwood and family on the passing of her husband, Larry. Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, for Ramona Walhoff, uh, full recovery from COVID and protection from long COVID. So she must have come home from her conference with COVID. Uh, sorry to hear that, but we lift up Ramona, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, from Linda Sloop, prayers for all of dealing uh, with the intense heat in the south and the northeast and the flooding. Lord, yeah. hear our prayers. Also from Linda, uh, prayers for Mac McDaniel uh, right, for hip replacement surgery recovery. So Mac is now living in New York, I think. Right. But a uh, long time member here. Keep Mac in your prayers, Lord. Hear our prayers. And um, from Peggy, soothing for all whose hearts are hurting for whatever reason. Lord, hear our prayers. Let us uh, take a moment to join our hearts in prayer. O oh God, who plant seeds of hope and justice in our lives, we're so grateful for this community of faith and for all anywhere who hunger and thirst for your healing, reconciling word. You know the things that are on our hearts today, and you bring us together in love and support. We ask for your healing mercies with those who struggle with, with illnesses, with feelings of being lost and marginalized, for those who mourn, for those for whom the darkness of sorrow and check and shrouds them, our prayers for situations in the world that affect so many people negatively. And for those prayers that we carry in our hearts. We ask that your growth producing love may be magnified by all those who celebrate and rejoice today. Be with each one of us and with all those whom we have named in our hearts before. Help us to reach out to each other in compassion and support as we ask these things in the name of Jesus and join together in the prayer that he taught as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass. And 
lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. I wish I could sing like Barbara. Uh, but it's announcement time, so I encourage you all to listen. Um, there are very detailed announcements in the bulletin, and I'll just share some highlights. Community dinner is this Friday evening, and we will be eating inside. Is that correct, Emily? Because of the heat. And um, there's a volunteer sign up. I understand there's plenty of volunteers for the kitchen, but they need a cleanup. Some more for the cleanup crew. So if you can help with that on Friday evening, please do so. Also, there's Whitney Family Camp sign up on the back table with dates and details are in the bulletin. And uh, John is the only one here today who can answer your questions, but she is. So ask her anything that you would like to know. United Women in Faith are having a yard sale on September 9th. So you've got about a little over a month to go through your closets and see if you would like to donate, um, <clears throat> accepting everything but clothing and electronics. And uh, <clears throat> the purpose of the yard sale is to raise, raise money for our scholarship fund. We give a scholarship to graduating seniors uh, every year. And we need to bolster that fund. Uh, the Boise Community Band is we're going to be giving a concert this Wednesday, July 19th at 7.30 in Julia Davis Park in front of the bandstand. Uh, the band is made up of about 80 members who range from 9 to 94. Louis Whitty, who's not here today because he's in Nashville at a bachelor party, um, and I are in the band. Louis plays the euphonium and I play the clarinet and the uh, it's a lot of fun for us, and I think it would be a lot of fun for you. It's a Fox concert, and uh, really nice for a summer evening. Bring your own chair. <laughs> Most of us have received the uh, Whitney Quarterly, and there are extra copies on the back if you didn't receive one this past week. There are lots of good articles and pictures that give us an idea of the many things that are happening and have been happening at Whitney Church for the past few months. I'd like to encourage you to read Pastor Darrell's message concerning our financial situation. We've had a number of unforeseen expenses in the past months. We have made cuts and we continue to look for ways to save, but frankly, we need to pray about what we can personally do to help us out of this situation. Currently, our ministries are not in danger, but we do need to keep the doors open and the lights on. I love this church, and I really feel that God has a purpose for us here on this corner. And I think that we can keep this church going, we can keep these do doors open. So please pray. Take a look at your own finances. I did that last night, and I found some places where I didn't need to keep that for myself. And I think if we all do that, and pray about what we can do to help. This church will continue to be a beacon of light for those who live in this community. And now please carefully prepare your ties and your offerings. <laughs>
Let us pray. Gardener God, we thank you for all the blessings you have poured into our lives. Receive these gifts that they may become seeds of hope and love for our community and for your world. We offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you for a moment to have a seat while we learn this song, and then when we sing it, you got to stand back. Hopefully, you'll feel like you want to stand and sing. This is the in this world, like Jesus, it's an African song from Zimbabwe. Um, and we're going to learn English and a little bit of the uh, Shona, the traditional Shona Zimbabwe language, and learn the song together. There's no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one in this world like him. There's no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. And let's try just that much to sing together. <laughs> There's no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one in this world like Him. There's no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Him. That'll go pretty well. And then the next part is, although that repeats, and it repeats and jumps around, it does have to follow me as we go. And this part I'm running, running, let's sing it through. I'll sing it through once and then you can sing it through once with me and we'll hope we get the, they we're on the right rhythm together. I'm running, running, searching, searching, I'm turning, turning, searching, searching, I'm searching, searching everywhere. There's no one, there's no one like you. Let's try that together. I'm running, running, searching, searching, I'm turning, turning, searching, searching, I'm searching, searching everywhere. There's no one, there's no one like you. And then the last part we're not gonna, is we're going to learn a little bit of Shona. Uh, you've heard of Hakuna Matata? Well, look at us. Hakuna Wakaita Sa Yesu, Hakuna Wakaita Sa Ye. Akuna wa kaita sa yesu, aku, aku, china, 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 china. So let's try singing that part. Akuna wa kaita sa yesu, akuna wa kaita sa ye. Akuna wa kaita sa yesu, aku, aku. All right, so now we're going to stand. We're going to try to sing this. There'll be some repeats also, and um, Kathy will do her best to follow me because I don't know where I'm going until I go there, but I'll try to shout out ahead of time whether we're going to go, there's no one like Jesus, or whether we're running, or whether we're like So we'll start with there's no one in this world like Jesus. Don't feel bad about moving. Of no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one in this world like Him. There's no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Him. Repeat that in English. There's no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one in this world like Him. There's no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like me. I'm running, I'm running, running, searching, searching. I'm turning, turning, searching, searching. I'm searching, searching everywhere. There's no one, there's no one like me. Let's sing that again. I'm running, running, searching, searching. I'm turning, turning, searching, searching. I'm searching, searching everywhere. There's no one, there's no one like you. There's no one like Jesus. There's no one in this world like Jesus. No one in this world like you. There's no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. One more time in English. There's no one in this world like 
Jesus. There's no one in this world like me. There's no one in this world like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like me. I could not look right up. I could not look right up. Thank you. 